It's a privilege, brothers and sisters, to join with you this morning for this devotional assembly. I'm really not a stranger to the BYU campus. I have been enrolled here as a graduate student. We have uh, two daughters who have been students here at BYU, one daughter-in-law and uh, one son-in-law who will be graduating at the conclusion of this uh, summer semester. I have no real difficulty in uh, identifying with any of the colleges in, and universities in the northern part of the state. I began my college education at the University of Utah with a basketball scholarship there. I later transferred to Utah State University, where I graduated. I've also uh, taught at the Institute adjacent to the Weber State College campus. So I have no problem in, uh, in dividing my loyalties among these schools, all of which are, are excellent institutions. I would like to share with you uh, this morning some thoughts about thoughts. While serving as a mission president, I was uh, I was interested in the frequency with which missionaries in our personal interviews would ask me the question, President, how do I control my thoughts? In that uh, <clears throat> intensive environment where a keen level of spirituality is so essential to the success of the missionaries, it didn't take long for these young men and young women to realize that uh, a level of spiritual power was necessary for them in order to succeed, and that thoughts are very instrumental in the acquisition of that power and influence. I've been intrigued for many years about thoughts and the compelling power of thoughts. In the uh, children's classic The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett, Mrs. Burnett gives us these observations in children's language. One of the new things people began to find out in the last century was that thoughts, just mere thoughts, are as powerful as electric batteries, as good for one as sunlight is, or as bad for one as poison is. To let a sad thought or a bad thought get into your mind is as dangerous as letting a scarlet fever germ get into your body. If you let it, let it stay there after it has got in, you may never get over it so long as you live. Thoughts have a great deal to do with how we live, whether we are enthusiastic or depressed, whether we enjoy success or experience a degree of failure, whether we enjoy spirituality or suffer from the lack of it, and in many respects I believe whether we are obedient or disobedient to the laws of God. Some modern behaviorists have indicated that the human thought process is very much like the operation of a computer, and that uh, where the conscious and subconscious mind is concerned, the input which we make into that process has much to do with the output in terms of attitude and mood and behavior. The Lord has recognized the great power of thoughts, and he warned those whom he addressed in his Sermon on the Mount against the influence of evil or negative thoughts. Proverbs tells us that as a man thinketh, 
in his heart, so is he. And to paraphrase that slightly, I think it would be very accurate to say that as a man persists in his thinking, so he will become. There is that kind of power in thoughts. The Lord has even indicated that we will be judged in some measure on the basis of our thoughts in the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants as he describes the, the ushering in of the millennial period and the summoning forth for judgment of all of those who have inhabited the earth during its millennia of existence, describes those uh, who are called forth who lived upon the earth in the first thousand years by the sounding of a trump, and then in the second thousand years. And he says, And then shall the second angel sound his trump and reveal the secret acts of men and the thoughts and intents of their hearts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How do we control this awesome power? Not only to prevent uh, and defend ourselves from the possible detrimental and evil influence of bad thoughts, but how can we utilize this great power to achieve the fulfillment of life's purpose for us here, as the Lord would have us do? I remember vividly a description which Elder Marion D. Hanks at one time gave of one's thought processes. And he described, uh, with the aid of a chalkboard, and if you can visualize with me this morning, two circles next to each other. Elder Hanks pointed out that we have two compartments of this kind in our thinking apparatus. He referred to the one as a foyer or antechamber and indicated that none of us really has complete power over the impulses, the fleeting thoughts that come into that uh, antechamber area, prompted by things that we may uh, see or hear or smell. Those impulses come constantly into a mind that is ever active. And then Elder Hanks pointed out that as unwelcome visitors in our home where we live, we have the power to usher out almost instantaneously those thoughts which come into that antechamber. And it's very essential that we develop the capacity to do this. And then Elder Hanks also pointed out that when we have made that kind of sorting out of the thought impulses which come to us, we invite into the living room of our thoughts, into our hearts, as it were, those thoughts which will do us good and which prompt us to do the things that are right. That illustration has been helpful to me in developing some discipline and capacity to control thoughts, to avoid the negative, as well as to invite that which is constructive and positive and good. It requires great discipline to take greatest advantage of the thought process. I learned in the mission field, as many of you who have served missions will know, that an interesting phenomenon occurs with missionaries who are assigned to an area where immediate success may not be uh, attached to their work. I learned that uh, when missionaries would call me or write to me and say, President, uh, we have worked this area out. There is no one here we can baptize that I must agree with what they said because uh, uh, when they came to that conclusion, they indeed could not find anyone. And generally, I made an immediate transfer 
of those missionaries from that area. It was always interesting and curious to note that uh, those who would then replace them, if their thoughts were right, and if the data being fed into that computer was correct, that they would often go out and find great success where others had failed. I've learned that our moods, our attitudes toward daily living, toward each other, are in large measure regulated by our thoughts. I believe, to a large degree, I can control whether or not I am happy today or unhappy, whether I'm enthusiastic <clears throat> about my possibilities or whether I'm depressed and negative. I've discovered, as perhaps you have done, that if I allow myself to slip into a pattern of negative, depressed thinking, although my circumstances have not changed, I can make myself very unhappy. My prospects seem extremely dim. And I can reverse that almost as easily by replacing those thoughts with uh, others that are constructive. Let me read to you just a sentence or two further from Mrs. Burnett's observations in this same children's classic I referred to a moment ago. She tells here about a boy, Colin, who is one of the interesting characters in this story. So long as Colin shut himself up in his room and thought only of his fears and weaknesses and his detestation of people who looked at him and reflected hourly on humps and early death, he was a hysterical, half-crazy little hypochondriac who knew nothing of the sunshine and the spring and also did not know that he could get well and could stand upon his feet if he tried to do it. When new beautiful thoughts began to push out the old hideous ones, life began to come back, and his blood ran healthily through his veins and strength poured into him like a flood. His scientific experiment was quite practical and simple, and there was nothing weird about it at all. Much more surprising things can happen to anyone who, when a disagreeable or discouraged thought comes into his mind, just has the sense to remember in time and push it out by putting in an agreeable, determinedly courageous one. Two things cannot be in one place. Where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. I've heard counsel given with regard to devices that might be used to protect us temporarily from the effects of bad thoughts or evil thoughts. I've heard the suggestion that we might uh, sing a song, a phrase from a Latter-day Saint hymn, or recite some poetry or some verses of scripture. But this, in reality, is a defensive stance, and one cannot always be on defense against evil thoughts. One must assume the offense, and the best way I've learned to achieve this is to practice sustained, constructive thinking. And that's an exercise, brothers and sisters, that requires as much training and as much conditioning as the physical endurance required to run a long-distance race. And I commend to you this morning the, uh, the exercise of sustained, constructive thinking. As a mission president, I traveled great distances over the um, state of Texas, and you can drive a long way in the state of Texas. And I used to spend many hours traveling alone, going from one missionary meeting or inter one set of interviews to another in the automobile they provided for us. And there was a lot, a lot of time to think, and many thoughts come in a situation of that kind. 
And I discovered that it was a very helpful thing for me, and later very useful, if I used that time to practice organizing talks that I could give, forming associations of scriptural ideas and principles that would one time, at one time perhaps be helpful to me in, in expressing these relationships to others. Some of the best talks you'll never hear I gave to myself as I drove from one place to another in southern Texas. I recommend that process to you. In order to sustain constructive thinking, it's necessary for us to have something worthwhile to think about, to have in reserve, as it were, some items, some problems, some challenges to which we can turn our mind to think our way through to a solution. I've discovered in my own life that that's the best way to obtain inspiration and whatever degree of revelation we are entitled to. I think of the account given of Enos in the Book of Mormon, when Enos, on a day when he apparently was free and uh, had set out for a purpose somewhat different from the result that was achieved, was alone, hunting for beasts, he said. But his thoughts began to run upon the things that he had heard his father say with regard to eternal life. Behold, I went to hunt beasts in the forest, and the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning the etern eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. They went into the living room of his thoughts, where the greatest effect can be found. And then Enos had some marvelous experiences as he focused his thoughts upon the acquisition of a blessing from God, one who has not shared that experience with Enoch, who's not reached out to the extent of his own thinking ability, and then found the union that's there with the pure intelligence which will respond to that kind of effort has missed a great experience. And I testify to you that the Lord responds to that kind of thinking, and that one who will reach out with the thought of his heart and all the intent of his heart for that kind of acquisition will not go wanting. Not long ago, I had a young lady come to my office who was, being, who was engaged and was about to be married. And as we talked about uh, a number of things, she said, how can I be sure now, having gone through this experience of my life where I've had uh, some tentative attachments to a number of young men, and where I've been exploring and considering many possibilities, how can I be assured now that I have made my choice of an eternal companion, that I can focus all of my loyalties with him, that I can be true not only in deed but in my thoughts and the intents of my heart. And I talked with her about the great need for discipline, for disciplining one's thoughts, of never considering any other possibilities. And one must control his thoughts if he's to achieve that. One of the greatest lessons taught in, in all of the literature available to us with regard to the power of thought is the story of David, King David, in the Old Testament. As a young man, uh, David demonstrated a courage and a strength and a power that uh, likely has not been equaled in all of the great characters of the scriptures. Fought with wild beasts and overcame them, 
defeated the giant Goliath virtually with his hands, and then having served through uh, many years as the leader of Israel, and having demonstrated in the process tremendous control, tremendous discipline, the greatest enemy he had perhaps through more, most of those years, at least the greatest threat to his existence, was the man Saul. And yet, uh, on several occasions, when David could have removed this threat by taking the life of Saul, who was in his hands, he, he withdrew and he withheld and controlled those impulses that demonstrated tremendous power and control. And then later in his life as a mature man, with all the strength that that kind of life had brought him, David was unwise. It was not that David was weak that he fell. He was unwise. I suspect that David had reached the point where he felt he was strong enough to indulge the entertainment of some enticing possibilities. And on the day as he stood on his rooftop and observed the wife of one of his officers, instead of taking himself by the nap of the neck, so to speak, and saying, David, get out of here. David remained, and David thought about the possibilities. And those thoughts overcame David, and they eventually controlled him. And one of the saddest entries in all of our scripture, I think, is that which the Lord gave to the prophet Joseph Smith in the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, where speaking of David's situation today. He says, For he hath fallen from his exaltation and received his portion. And then with reference to David's wives and families, the Lord says, For I have given them unto another, saith the Lord. David, King David, one of the great and powerful men of the Old Testament times could have been today among the gods if he had controlled his thoughts. There is compelling power in thoughts. There is compelling strength in those thoughts that will bring to us the things that are good. The Savior, as he spoke to some of his followers in, in uh, Jerusalem, made this observation. For out of the abundance of the heart, and I suspect he had reference here to the living room of our mind, to which Elder Hanks made reference. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. He went on to say, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. It's no wonder, then, that the Savior would warn that one who entertained these things in his mind, in his thoughts, was guilty of something approaching the very act, and would indeed, if he sustained those kinds of thoughts, would become guilty of the act. In his final challenge and admonition to us, Moroni indicates the 
the power and the promise of pondering things in our hearts. When he says, Behold, I would exhort you that when ye shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God, that ye should read them. That you remember and go on, and he goes on and makes a reference to the things that have transpired. And then says, Even down to the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. And that's an exercise. That's a labor, brothers and sisters. That's some of the most engaging and difficult work that one can do. If you will ponder these things in your hearts, then he makes the promise that follows with regard to the blessing of testimony through the power and the influence of the Holy Ghost. I would like to bear testimony to you today, brothers and sisters, that there is great power in thoughts, and that if we will exercise control and develop the discipline which is needed to sustain positive, constructive thinking, there will be great blessings come into our lives. One of the young missionaries who came into our mission shortly before we left in one of the last testimony meetings that uh, Sister Larson and I attended with our missionaries bore a testimony which was simple and yet profound, and the more I contemplate it, the more profound it becomes to me. He said, I have learned already, having been in the mission field only several weeks at the time, I have learned already <clears throat> that the gospel is just as true for those who reject it as it is for those who accept it. And I'm sure that this young man had in mind that uh, in that great body of eternal principles, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, there were forces at work which inevitably react in one way or another upon our lives, depending <clears throat> in great measure upon how we think about them. He meant, I'm sure, that in whatever we think, in whatever we say, in whatever we do, we evoke from those eternal principles some response for good or ill which inevitably reflects itself in the very nature of our own souls. We testify to one another regularly that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true, and it is true. It is truly the gospel of Jesus Christ, as opposed to any other life systems or life plans that may have been advanced by other men. It is truly his gospel. The Church of Jesus Christ is truly the Church of Jesus Christ, as opposed to other organizations that may have been contrived. The gospel is true in that it will yield for us from those, e those principles, according to the way we think and act and feel, those things which have been promised to us. In that sense, my brothers and sisters, the gospel, Je the gospel of Jesus Christ is also true, irrevocably, unyieldingly, everlastingly true. May we be blessed with the power to control our thoughts that the most productive benefits can come to us as a result. 
may we be blessed with the desire to guide our thoughts into those channels where loyalties to things that are good and true will be sustained, where evil can be avoided, and where the promises of the Lord which he has made to all of us who are faithful will one day be ours, that we may enjoy his presence in the eternities to come and be recipients of all the power and the glory that he's promised to us, who are those of us who are faithful. I pray and invoke the Lord's blessings upon all of you in your endeavors here to improve your capacities and your talents and to regulate your thoughts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.